Today, we will be taking a look at World War I and the Versailles Settlement as the immediate backdrop to World War II. Now, in the years before 1914, all this nationalism and global competition between Western powers was, was beginning to form a very, very unstable international environment. Now, the Germans, starting in the late 1800s and developing under Kaiser Wilhelm II, began their doctrine of Weltpolitik, whereby Germany would transform into a potent imperialist power. Naval development would be streamlined, rampant militarism, and massive industrial expansion would result. Now, on the topic of Germany, we have to talk about the Kaiser at the time, which was Wilhelm II. And to say that he was profoundly terrible at his job would be an understatement. He fired Bismarck, um, mostly because Bismarck was against this idea of a, of, you know, a global aggressive foreign policy of imperialism. Kaiser Wilhelm, you know, he was caught up at the times. He wanted to be like the other Western powers. He fired him. And he failed to renew the non-aggression pact with Russia, who then, of course, allied with France and Britain, politically isolating Germany. Now, the Germans, therefore, were forced to turn to their ineffective, weakening Habsburg Austro-Hungarian neighbor. Now, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had been declining for some time uh, by 1914, so um, not the greatest ally to be heading to a war with. Now, World War I was foreshadowed by the Morocco Crisis of 1905, whereby basically, to sum it up, the Germans and the French competed over influence over the rule of Morocco. This created a horrific tension between France and Germany in particular, and really foreshadowed the coming uh, battle between France and Germany in World War I. And by the end of the Morocco crisis, there are clear political divisions in Europe. The first is the Triple Entente, making, made up of Britain, France, and Russia primarily. And then we have, of course, the central powers of Germany, Austria-Hungary, um, Austria and the Ottoman Empire, which had been declining for some time at this point. Now, no place in Europe had such strong nationalist uh, feelings and extreme resentment and bitterness as the Balkans. Now, as some background information here, uh, Serbia and the Serbian people were seen as the de facto hegemon of the Slavic peoples in the Balkans. That is to say, you know, they had a lot of power in their hands. They had a lot of influence. They hoped to unite the Balkan peoples against both the Austro-Hungarian aggressive neighbor to the west and north, and of course, against the Turks who occupied much of uh, this area of Europe for many years and had since the late medieval period. Now, of course, this makes them a threat to Austria-Hungary, whose fragile empire at this time incorporated many, many Slavic peoples in their borders, one of them being, of course, the Bosnian peoples. Now, around this time, we have the Ottoman Revolution, and the Turks had to leave Bosnia which, of course, gave the Austro-Hungarians a chance to run in and, um, well, uh, annex the region. This angered the Serbs, of course, because, again, they are hoping to unite the Balkan peoples under one political state, mostly under Serbian hegemony. So, of course, they appeal to Russia, seen as the, protect the greatest of the Slavic nations, who, unfortunately, ended up backing down because Germany backed Austro-Hungary's uh, decision to annex Bosnia. This caused extreme anger in the Balkans. And of course, in 1912, ending in 1913, we have the ferocious Balkan Wars, which ended up, long story short, stripping the Ottoman Turks of their European holdings. And by the end of it all, the Greeks, um, the people of Montenegro, Serbians, and Bulgarians were all free from the political and direct domination of the Turks. It is worth noting, of course, that all this anger culminated in the Black Hands, a Serbian nationalist group that worked against the Austro-Hungarians. Now, they have, of course, a connection to the Young Bosnia Group, a group of Serbo-Bosnian Slavs who hated being ruled by the Austro-Hungarians. Now, this organization was split two ways, between the Yugoslavists and the Pan-Serbians. Yugoslavists believed that they should, um, you know, when they get their independence, they should form a massive Slavic nation called Yugoslavia. And the Pan-Serbians obviously believed, as many Serbians did, naturally, that they should simply fall under the sway of Serbia. Now, Gavrilo Princip was one such assassin in the Black Hand, and he, of course, is who assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary on June 20th, 1914 in Sarajevo, Bosnia. This is seen as the event, rather the flashpoint, that caused World War I. We have many, um, you know, background events, but no event caused such an immediate burst of anger and uh, bloodshed in Europe as the assassination of the Archduke. Now, given the Turkish decline in the Balkans, there was a power gap left over the influence of the Slavs, 
which of course was competed for by Russia and Austro-Hungary. And of course, Russia is a Slavic nation, naturally is a large, large threat to the Austro-Hungarian aims in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So of course, when Archduke Franz Ferdinand is assassinated, uh, it's pretty clear that this is going to cause a massive, massive political disaster. Now, Austria-Hungary gives an ultimatum to Serbia. The Serbians, naturally refusing the ridiculous demands, which were pretty extreme, um, for sure, Austria-Hungary declared war, of course, with their ally Germany backing them. Now, Russia declared on the side of their Serbian ally against the Germans and Austro-Hungarians. The German movement in the neutral Belgium, of course, forced Britain to declare war on the central powers. Now, this idea of massive coalitions and alliance systems as tools for overwhelming political foes, this is really a residual political system in uh, Europe that was basically meant to prevent another Napoleon Bonaparte situation from erupting, where you have one single power, you know, piecemeal destroying all of your enemies one by one until there's really no one left to stand against you. But as we see here, the coalition system actually just caused another horrific war. Now, the Germans dreamed up this Schlieffen plan. It basically entailed rushing France and the English by passing through the Ardennes forest in Belgium. In, uh, excuse me, Belgium. Now, unfortunately, a horrific standstill developed, which led to bloody, bloody trench warfare with little, yeah, pretty much uh, negligible progress. Even over the course of years, um, you know, you had bloodbaths at battles such as Verdun and the Somme. And of course, this stalemate forces tech development. After all, if no one has the potential with manpower and strategy alone to take the other trench and to push the line forward, perhaps technological advancements will give one side the edge. And of course, World War I is where we first see poison gas, tanks, and advanced weaponry um, being unleashed upon the battlefields of Europe. Now, it's worth noting that the Ottomans did join the Central Powers. You know, there was a horrific fight at the, you know, at the Gallipoli landings where the Turks actually, um, they fight off the Allies. Um, you know, this is pretty much their only success. The Ottomans actually were conti continually crumbling throughout this war. Um, the British, of course, would send uh, Lawrence of Arabia to stir up the Arabs to break away from the Turks. So it, it might seem like the Ottomans initially have some, um, you know, some successes, but Really, this war is what finishes them. Now, the Germans would eventually send the Zimmerman Telegram, which is essentially a telegram to Mexico, telling them that if they declare war on the United States, that Mexico has the possibility of regaining the lands lost during the American-Mexican War. They refused this, and British intelligence told us about this, which infuriated the American public. Not to mention the Germans also engage in unrestricted submarine warfare, which, of course, you know, these things eventually bring the United States into the war. Woodrow Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war in 1917. And, of course, um, you know, there are various events abroad. You know, the Italians do, you know, they do push into Austria-Hungary. The Entente does eventually take Damascus. So it might seem like these are great successes, but I would like to point out that over the course of the war in Europe itself, along the Eastern Front and the Western Front particularly, um, movement was very minimal. And in places such as Somme and Verdun, um, ridiculous losses of life took place for relatively uh, little gain in terms of land. Here we see a downed uh, British tank in the mud. And here we see a machine gun, a machine gun nest with some gas, some pretty primitive gas masks on. But we see that there is technological development worth mentioning in the First World War. Now, one side that really suffered horrendously during the First World War was Russia. Now, Russia, of course, was under the um, Tsar, Nicholas II Romanov at this time. And while the man was well-intentioned, Russia just suffered defeat after defeat after defeat, with Tannenberg being perhaps the consummate Russian defeat. Now, Tsar Nicholas II ends up abdicating after the war goes pretty badly, leading to enormous battlefield failures, supply and food shortages, which of course lead to rioting and mutinies among the men, and a provisional government is formed to oversee a transitional period into a new government. Yet, this, you know, this government continued to support the war, which made it very, very unpopular at home. This state, of course, was operated by elite capitalist Democrat ideologues, so these are still people that wanted to become sort of like the West. These are not, you know, Slavophiles, they're not fascists, and they're certainly not Marxists. 
a around this time a you have a Marxist intellectual and political leader named Vladimir Lenin who demanded that all the power be put into the control of the Soviet councils. You know these you know these uh, urban worker councils and uh, organizations. And in the October of 1917, the Petrograd Soviet under um, Trotsky voted for armed insurrection. Now Trotsky would later be betrayed by Joseph Stalin, but he is alive at this point and politically relevant. Now, the Russian civil war between the Marxist and the anti-Marxist lasts until 1923, which, of course, leads to the formation of the Soviet Union in 1922. Now, there was a popular vote held around this period because there was still some uncertainty in the era over what the new government would look like. And the vote revealed that only about a fifth of the population actually supported the Marxist Bolsheviks under Vladimir Lenin. So Lenin makes the decision to disband the Soviets and all civil liberties as well and forms a fairly stern autocracy. He, he, he pretty much formed a dictatorship, just a Marxist dictatorship. Now, the Mensheviks, who were, of course, just um, socialists that weren't quite as radical as the Bolsheviks, they were brutally repressed, as were liberals or anyone deemed a counter-revolutionary, including um, a large portion of uh, public intellectuals, you know, the intelligentsia, they were repressed, and the Bolsheviks destroyed them. Now, of course, this anti-Marxist army formed with even foreign volunteers on the side of the anti-Marxist. This was called the White Army. However, they were too geographically separated, and Vladimir Lenin eventually, yeah, he did defeat them. Now, when Vladimir Lenin dies, um, power was not supposed to go to Joseph Stalin, as we, who we see over here on the right, but it did. And he was the secretary general of the Communist Party. Now, he managed to centralize the bureaucracy under himself. He controlled the secret police, known as the NKVD. And in the 1920s and 30s, I know we're jumping a bit ahead, but it's important for the backdrop of the Second World War, he led a fairly large purge of people that he deemed to be political and social enemies. You know, all ideological opponents of any form, be them in party or just society at whole, he exterminated as many as he could find. Unfortunately, many of these supposed... Uh, opponents were many people in his own military staff. And in fact, only 12 of, of the 100 highest ranking commanders were still alive after 1939, a huge problem when, for when Hitler launches Operation Barbarossa. Now, Stalin, of course, launched collectivization, which were basically, you know, the mass rounding up and unification of agriculture units into a single unit, which, you know, all their output would be sent to the cities to support mass, mass industrialization. You know, Russia was always sort of this socially, technologically backward nation, even back in the 1500s. You know, Peter the Great understood this. This is nothing new. So Stalin hopes to rapidly, you know, bring his country to the power level of the Western nations. He wouldn't quite achieve it, but he would make massive, massive strides. Unfortunately, sending all this food to the East caused massive starvation among the Western farms. The Ukrainians were particularly hard hit by this. Now, of course, this is a series of lectures on World War II, not World War I. So now that the details and the general trends have been explained, it's important to understand how World War I ends with three large changes in Europe. The first, as we just noticed, was Tsar Nicholas II being, you know, forcibly, you know, he, he abdicated. He had to leave. He was, he was not fit to rule and people were tired of tolerating him. So Russia falls to Vladimir Lenin and his Marxists. However, the far more relevance effect of uh, World War I for Western Europe was the Treaty of Versailles. Now, the Central Powers do end up losing World War I, and Germany was particularly targeted in the Versailles settlements. The French, in particular, really disliked Germany for what they had done, and Germany was forced to accept a very humiliating guilt clause, saying essentially that you know, German militarism was most responsible for causing the war. This is a historical. But Germany lost. Well, what can you do? It's noted, of course, that um, you know, massive tracts of land were given away to um, other powers. There were massive reparation payments. Germany lost all of its colonies. They lose land to the Polish state, which was expanded. They lose Alsace-Lorraine to the French. There becomes a 100,000 cap on the army, and that is quite small. It might sound large. It's not. That's a small army for a nation as big as Germany. And, of course, a demilitarized buffer zone in the Rhineland was uh, set up as a buffer between France and Germany. Of course, as the Great Depression, you know, strengthens in the 1930s, Germany is absolutely impoverished and excessively punished by this. 
there is extreme anger and resentment that would breed future violence. This violent, you know, this resentment and violence in the streets would take the form of the politics of Adolf Hitler, you know, the violence of World War One and the uh, abysmal atmosphere of the 30s really was the backdrop on which Hitler, um, and not just Adolf Hitler, the other fascists at large, would make a name for themselves. Now, the third effect that we see is that Austria-Hungary disintegrates. It just falls to pieces. It, it had been falling to pieces for some time, and World War I was just the last nail in the coffin, so to speak. The Austrian parliament dethrones the Habsburgs, finally, and banishes Charles I. Uh, there was land lost to various powers as well. But, you know, the uh, Austria-Hungary lost land to Romania, and the nation of Yugoslavia was formed, making up made up of Serbs, Croats, and Slovens in the Treaty of Trianon. Now, in the Treaty of Saint Germain and Lai, this further divided the Austrian half of the empire into Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Italy. Well, I, and by that I mean land, of course, was given to Poland and Italy. They were already nations. So now we will look at some particular issues with the Versailles settlement. What exactly were the particulars that made the Treaty of Versailles so ridiculous? Well, for one, the Treaty of Versailles really failed to solve the ethnic minority problem, particularly in Eastern Europe. The dispersions and separation of peoples after World War I, you know, it, it radically redrew the map of Europe. And minorities were split into different nations in uneven, tenuous numbers. This inspired the idea of revanchism. You know, this desire to reclaim lost lands from World War I. And of course, you know, tangentially to that, the desire to reunite ethnic enclaves separated by redrawings of the map. Now, these newly formed, uh, demo you know, democracy states in Eastern Europe, they are pretty fearful of their aggressive Soviet neighbor under Joseph Stalin. And they eventually turn to Germany for protection. Now, these, these nations are relatively new. Uh, new and especially because of the Great Depression, there's no stable economic or industrial apparatus that make them, you know, this makes them pretty vulnerable amidst the Great Depression. And it's worth noting, of course, that the Great Depression really undermined the validity of capitalism as a valid theory of economics. So many states, fearful of Marxists on one hand and capitalist failures amidst, uh, amidst the Depression, lead many people to turn towards fascism, you know, fascist state theory. It's worth noting, of course, that Czechoslovakia did not take this route, but many other states did. And of course, you know, the parliaments of these democracies are absolutely just wealthy elites. They are oligarchies, essentially. And this is not lost on people who naturally turn to, you know, demagoguery and populists, such as Benito Mussolini, for example. Now, many, uh, you know, these virgin states, as we'll call them, they were really designed to act as buffers against both the Soviets and to box in, you know, Germany, whom the French despised and had despised for many years at this point. So right off the bat, the idea that these new nations are formed partially out of spite for Germany, this prompts an atmosphere of, you know, German mistrust, anger, bitterness, you know, you name it against the French. So there is definitely a beef going on, and Adolf Hitler would eventually intend to settle it. As Hitler said in Mein Kampf, you know, the French are an unquestionable enemy of the German people. And now that, you know, the details of World War I have been covered um, as much as I think they need to be, we can begin talking about World War II in the next lecture.